I am a security researcher and I'm a patient. Every single beat of my heart is generated by a medical device, a pacemaker, a machine implanted in my body. Four years ago, I woke up lying on the floor. It turned out I had fallen because my heart had taken a pause long enough to cause unconsciousness. To keep up my pulse and to stop my heart from taking breaks, I needed to get a pacemaker implanted in my chest. This little device monitors each heartbeat and sends a small electrical signal directly to my heart to keep it running. But how can I trust my heart when it's running on proprietary code and there's no transparency? When I got the pacemaker, it was an emergency situation. I needed the device to stay alive, so there was really no option to not have the implant. It was, however, time to ask questions. To the surprise of my doctors, I began asking questions about the potential security vulnerabilities in the software running on the pacemaker and the possibilities of hacking this life-critical device. The answers were unsatisfying. My healthcare providers could not answer my technical questions about computer security, and there was little information to obtain from the medical device manufacturer. This is why I decided to seek out this information myself. Imagine that this is your heartbeat, a heartbeat generated by a machine running code inside of your body. Would you also like to know if it can be trusted? Can hackers break my heart? To answer this question, I decided to use the competence I have on IT security, unlike most patients that get pacemakers at an older age. So I started a project together with some of my security researcher friends, where we tried to figure out if and how it can be hacked. How is the data generated by my own body secured? And is it possible for someone with malicious intent to obtain access to my implanted device remotely via its wireless communication interface? These are some of the answers we tried to find answers to in our research project. I did some research on the wireless communication, and I discovered that my pacemaker has the ability to collect my patient information and send it via the internet. With connectivity comes vulnerability. And as a security researcher, I'm worried because I know that our society is adopting connected technology faster than our ability to secure it. Part of the problem with doing security research in this field is that the code inside of my pacemaker is not available for me or other security researchers to look at. As a patient, I'm expected to trust the vendors when they claim that their devices are not vulnerable. But as a security researcher, I want to figure out how things actually work myself. And in this case, it meant going on eBay, purchasing used medical equipment, and hacking it. So these are some of the pacemakers that we are looking at in our research project. Several of these have been donated to me by supporters of my project, which I'm really grateful for. I am, of course, not doing any testing on my implanted device in this project. Here you can see one of the researchers and my team capturing the communication signals transmitted from the pacemaker. To find out how secure the pacemakers are, we open them up to find out how they are constructed and how they communicate. This type of hacking is called reverse engineering. It means getting into the minds of the engineers that built the product and figure out if there are any vulnerabilities in their implementation. Did they make any mistakes when designing, building, and coding the software inside of my pacemaker? Of course, this hacking has to be done in a responsible manner. The vulnerabilities we find in this project will not be publicly disclosed until we have worked with the vendor and to resolve and find possible fixes to the problems. Because I do not want to scare my fellow pacemaker patients or have anyone opting out of life-saving treatment because of fears of hacking. But it is already established that 
pacemakers and other medical devices can be hacked. It is possible to extract sensitive personal information from pacemaker and even threaten the patient's life by turning it off or changing its pacing behavior. Fortunately, such an attack cannot, it requires close proximity to the patient and it cannot be carried out remotely. Hacking of pacemakers via their internet connectivity, like you might have seen in some TV shows, has not been proven to be possible. However, no independent third-party research looking more closely into this has been published. Patient safety is not only threatened by actors of ill intentions. Devices can deliver the wrong treatment because of human errors and software bugs. I'm here today to tell my story, but others do not have this opportunity. Think about that. In this case, 13 patients died because of faulty cardiac devices. In 2005, two doctors went public with concerns after a 21-year-old patient died when his implanted cardiac defibrillator short-circuited and failed to revive him after he went into sudden cardiac arrest. The vendor had known about this short-circuiting issue since 2002, and they had also made several attempts of fixing it, but they had failed to alert the US re regulator of medical devices, the FDA, so that they could issue recalls and save patients' lives. I have first-hand experienced how it feels to have my heart controlled by a machine that is not working properly because of software bugs. Since I'm younger than most pacemaker patients, the default configuration settings of my device were not suitable to me. And it took several months before my doctors could figure out how to get this right. And this was complicated because of a software bug in the pacemaker programmer that they used to adjust the settings of the pacemaker. And the consequences of this greatly affected my well-being. Two weeks after my surgery, four years ago, I went to London with some of my colleagues to attend a course on ethical hacking and incident response. And this was the first time I realized that something was wrong with my pacemaker. We went off the train at this underground station at Covent Garden, and there were long queues at the elevator, so we headed for the stairs. As you can see from this warning sign, they do warn that patients with heart conditions should not use the stairs. I clearly did not read this sign. I was walking up the stairs, and then suddenly I was out of breath. I felt like I could not go on. It was almost like I felt I was going to die. You can compare it to the feeling you get if you try running uphill as fast as you can until you reach the point of exhaustion and you can't make it anymore. Only in my case, this feeling came up on me all of a sudden. I had no idea what hit me, but I realized it must be something wrong with the pacemaker. So after returning from the this trip, I went to a checkup at the hospital to see if they can figure out what was wrong. And this is what it looks like when the pacemaker technician is controlling my heart with the touch of a pen to this touch screen at the pacemaker programmer. As you can see from the picture, there's a stack of different programmers from the different vendors because they all communicate in different non-standard ways with the implants. On this screen, there are buttons for making my heart go faster, make my heart go slower, and even turning off the pacing completely. The problem was that the number shown on the programmer screen indicating the upper heart rate limit of the pacemaker was not the same number as the actual settings of the pacemaker. Because of this software bug, it took several months before they could figure out this problem. And in the meantime, I would get the same feeling of sudden exhaustion whenever I was trying to run for the bus or walking up some long stairs. Basically, the pacemaker was suited to match the activity level of an 80-year-old. And it would malfunction whenever my pulse went above 160 beats per minute. They eventually figured this out, despite of this programmer bug. And today, the pacemaker works perfectly. I even finished running a half marathon last year with the pacemaker. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm lucky because technology saved my life. I probably would not be here today if it wasn't for the pacemaker. The decision to implant a medical device is also a risky one. But in my case, the benefit of having the device clearly outweighs the risks. In my spare time, I am volunteering for a grassroots organization called I Am The Cavalry. We are focused on issues where computer security intersects with public safety and human lives. We work to improve the visibility and awareness of these issues while preserving trust. We collaborate among all stakeholders, we deal with concerns, and we try to find a common way forward where everyone wins. Recently, we published the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices. These are five steps that we want the vendors to implement, to adopt, to make them more secure for the future. No patients have, as far as I know, been killed due to a hacked pacemaker. But patients have been killed due to malfunction of their medical devices, configuration errors, and software bugs. In the future, many of you will live longer and healthier lives due to implanted medical devices and other types of sensors in your bodies. But this technology might also kill you if not implemented correctly. Security research in the form of preemptive hacking followed by coordinated vulnerability disclosure and vendor fixes can help save human lives. This is why I am calling upon the technology enthusiasts among us, the hackers, the tinkerers, the doers, to do more research on medical devices, to join me, to hack, to save lives. Thank you.